Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is about peanut butter and chocolate. I was going to do this whole Reese's Buttercup theme, but then I thought I'm probably going to get in too much trouble copyright wise, so I didn't. Um, but I still wanted to like keep that in there because I do see this as a similar thing. Some people are allergic to chocolate. Some people are allergic to peanut butter. It might not go great for you. Um, and it also might not go great if you're allergic to one and it gets inserted into the other. So um, I think that's like a good note to start off with where we're at. But at the same time, I think for those who aren't allergic and can consume both of those things at once, we can have magic happening. So um, that's what I wanted to cover. Um, so who am I? Um, currently, I'm the executive director of IEEE SA Open, uh, which is a, uh, it started off as a platform for open source um, in standards. And they expanded it also to be open hardware and open data because putting that in a PDF format is horrible. Um, and then it expanded to all of IEEE. And then when I joined, it expanded, expanded to the larger humanitarian good aspects. So there are a few rules to participating. Um, and one of those is humanitarian. It's not for a corporation to come in and like use up all the free resources. Uh, but <clears throat> that's where we're going with it. Um, but larger still, I got involved, honestly, with open source as a more of a participant and not just a consumer. I'd been a consumer since 95, but I became a, par a, a very active participant in 2004 because of wanting to do open government, um, in which everybody thought I was nuts. Um, and along with that, I also progressed over into open data because all of this open government and open research and all these things that the taxpayers had paid for, I wanted to see about how we could start opening all of that up. Um, thankfully, part of it was mentioned in Obama's um, presidential debates about that, and the, both of the CTOs, Vivek and Todd Parks, both um, took on opening up as much data sets as they could, which was uh, pretty awesome in regards to that. So, <clears throat> like I said, in 2004, we had just elected George W. Bush for the presidency, <laughs> and everybody thought I was nuts. <laughs> but now, looking at what's happening, who's crazy now? We're definitely going in that direction, and the conversations that we're having are really showing that. Um, so why open source? I'm not going to go into depth in this slide. This is my, that would be the uh, preacher preaching to the choir. Um, I am not going to go there. Y'all all know all, all of this. But what I would like to highlight a little bit is why are governments? Because it's slightly different. Um, it, it is all the normal open source reasons, but there's certain aspects like transparency with their, with their constituency can be very helpful. Um, there is the lower cost for scale, which is another reason, which is a lot of people are looking at. There's faster innovation. Um, there's a lot that's happening in regards to, and these are controversial topics, we'll talk about it a little bit more, digital sovereignty and digital autonomy, where governments want to take control of their citizens' data because they don't see that as being respected by other entities in the world. <clears throat> And then, of course, the collab actual collaboration with constituents. That's different than transparency, right? Transparency is just telling them. Collaboration mean, means doing, moving with them and going forward. And then also, they're trying to figure out how to contract and hire to move forward on this. And they don't always know what they're doing, and they're going to need our guidance. So yes, and um, I sneakily call this slide opportunities. Um, because as you can see, it's actually a lot of the difficulties, but I view all of this as being opportunities for all of us in this room, for all of the different ways that we can start to help and move this forward. I'll highlight a few in just a little bit. There's a lot in regards to just the plain staffing aspects and understanding how to run the projects and what all of that means. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that's policy driven and they need that for a lot of those different pieces and they need to have a certain amount of compliance in regards to all of that. Um, <clears throat> the biggest one, and you know, inspired by Dinesa's inner sourcing talk, um, they need help with culture and change agents. There's a lot of things that are very, very different between government and open source. And of course, one of the biggest one of those is going to be the speed issue and the governance issues. Those are very, very different, and they expect something that are a little bit heavier. Um, of course, the risk profile is different. I'm not going to go into that. There's a lot of specialists on it. Um, at some point in time, I can, but you know, the big thing for them is people can die. And then, of course, there's a lot of legal. So, one of the things that I, um, that I wanted to bring out to a lot of this is when you're thinking about this and you're thinking about the government stuff, 
Remember when corporations came into open source and how it changed things and what we did and use those as learning experiences for as we go forward with governments because I feel like it's another step in that direction in regards to both the maturity model and I mean maturity model in regards to having set patterns, having set processes, having all of those different pieces that need to be in place. Well, guess what? Government wants that even more than a normal corporation does, right? Because I would sit there and say, like, with governance, it kind of starts like startups where they're like, woohoo, and then corporations where it's like, ah, and then governments are like, whoa, Nelly. So, you know, you have to understand that we're going to be going through that and look towards some of those solutions that we did use to help with that. And also keep an eye because we're going to have similar conflicts, right? We're going to have some serious conflicts that come into play. We're going to have things where, where we have to negotiate back and forth between each other on this. So one thing that I would highly suggest doing is looking at what directions the governments are going in. Um, CI, CSIS um, did this whole policy research in 2010 that they're right now in the process of redoing, where they're actually going through and pulling down all the government policies that are involving open source and documenting all of them. This is really important. We need to get ahead of that as much as possible. <clears throat> um, there's also a lot that could happen in regards to the good thing. We should go look and sit there and see what they are currently funding, because some of them are. Um, both like France and Canada did a bunch of funding earlier for Big Blue Button, which really accelerated its process, and then they were able to all use it for their classrooms during lockdown. And it ended up um, being very good for them because uh, one of the things that they really focused in on was compliance for the children. And so unlike Zoom, there's no spying, it's completely GDPR compliant, there's a whole bunch of different things um, in regards to the security, um, that so things of that nature happened. And so that, that was kind of awesome, so look at what they're funding. And then there's a lot of think tanks that are starting to arise. Um, one good one that just happened was Appel out of France. They just did a good one. And of course, what were some of the major questions on there? Well, scale, hiring, and how do we fund it? Because funding is really difficult for them, right? Because of the fact that if you think corporations have a lot of regulations in regards to funding individual developers on open source, <laughs> government is crazy town. And so we're working with them to try to figure how, out how some of that happens. I'm betting the the horse on that, or I'm betting on the horse that, yeah, um, it's going to end up being foundations and um, larger nonprofit organizations where they'll be giving money to them for certain set causes, and then those will be going around and funding the individual ones via that, and that way they'll be doing a lot of the different vetting mechanisms. So um, I have both a love and a hate of this. Um, it is what is motivating in the EU right now. The EU is stuck in a very difficult place where it's got com American corporate dominance and then it's got some other things happening with Russia and China. <laughs> and so they're trying to figure out how do we protect our citizens, um, most definitely on the autonomy aspects of it in regards to the data. Um, some of the problems with that is, uh, guess what, data can be so easily copied. It's still really hard to track and make sure that things are safe. Um, but they're definitely trying and working out and doing a lot of policies in this direction. At the end of my slide deck, there's a bunch of links to a bunch of different policies that have been coming out, and one of, the, one of them is from the EC. <clears throat> and then, of course, we've got all the current events, right? You know, we had some wonderful work done on contact tracing for COVID-19, right? But, oh my God, if contact tracing isn't some of the scariest data that you can get on an individual. What is it? it only takes three pieces of data to figure out who someone is, and you're giving them millions. So be very aware of that. Unless and you're using Irish. Huh? Unless you're using Irish. Unless, unless you're using the Irish one that Denise was working on. And then you have the invasion of Ukraine, which is seeing a huge rise in awareness of OSINT. We have an OSINT expert in the house with Sarah. She's been educating me so much. Um, in regards to it, but you know, OSINT is open source intelligence and it just goes and gets the stuff that's already out there. It's not even stuff that ends up always having to be, you know, specially looked for or anything along those lines. 
and yet it still can tell us a lot about what's going on in Ukraine. And so I think that really raised awareness in regards to that. And that's one of the other re reasons that I think that digital sovereignty and autonomy is moving so fast forward in regards to that. And then, you know, the war on privacy in regards to that. And that's what I just talked about in regards to corporate America and uh, China's dominance. You know, uh, I, I do believe, uh, did France just issue something about TikTok? I think they just like two days ago. Um, because of all the data that they were harvesting. Um, basically, if you are a government employee, you are not allowed to have TikTok on any device. Um, they also banned Office 365 for the French government. And as you all know, several countries have been banning Google Analytics too. Um, so, so with governments, a lot of times, and with a lot of these different pieces, they are looking at tactical transparency. And I say that in two different ways. Tactical transparency can be both very good and very bad. Um, it can be how certain corporations only show you the stuff that you like and won't show you any of the other different pieces. And that definitely occurs. But here, I want to talk more about the privacy and security aspects of it and all the different concerns that government has in regards to that and how we have to bring that into our work too. <clears throat> And then there's the legitimate adoption of open source. I say legitimate, which is, ah, that might not be the best word in regards to it, but government's already using open source, all right? Just like everybody else is. You can go look at the Open UK's, um, uh, now it just falls out of my head. What's the name of it? State of Open. So there's three different amazing reports. Please read them. Um, and you'll sit there and see just how much is actually happening there. Um, but they're not really always, for the most part, I see very little participation until recently. I've seen very, very little engagement. I haven't seen, you know, coming into the community and being a part of the community and things of that nature. We need to get them to that point. We need to talk to them about, you know, open source program offices not being just about legal and compliance, <laughs> right? A good open source program office integrates with all of the different communities that they're working with. And we have to walk them through how that works. And for a lot of this, we're going to have to bring our A game. Because once again, I talked about their concerns about quality in regards to that, because people do die. You give out the wrong information, those kinds of things happen, people die. And we don't want that to be happening here. And so they're really going to ask us to bring the A game. You know, that's why the Linux Foundation and several others got called into the White House to talk about the Log4j, is because they were having those problems and they were worried about how that was going to impact the government itself because of so many people using those libraries. <clears throat> so, I'm a little biased. <laughs> I work at IEEE SA, stands for standards, open. Um, I believe one of the big things on this is going to be standards to the rescue. Um, just based off of all of my conversations that I end up having, all of, I'm not going to these entities. They're coming to me. And they're coming to me because they're like, oh, you're IEEE, you're standards, and you're open. So what should we do? What does this look like? How do we do all of this? And so I'm like, well, let's start in on the one that uh, Stephen Wally is leading, the Open Source Software Project Governance. It's very small. It's, well, it's not very small. It's very limited in scope. And we did that on purpose so that we could start to figure out what that process is going to look like going forward um, for open source in general, not just IEEE. And then, you know, safety ends up being a big concern. And like where I work, you know, it's huge, you know, because they do things like, how do you stand it for how do you how do you run a nuclear power plant? <laughs> so our processes might be a little heavy, um, but there's good reasons behind it. And um, I don't know if any of y'all got to see Stephen Wally's talk, but we do try really hard to make sure the people who come into standards do get indoctrinated into the culture that we have there. Um, and one of the other things that I think is really important about that is the consensus building mechanisms. Different standards are done in different ways. Some of them are built off of consensus. Some of them are built off of dominance. I warn against the dominance ones. <laughs> and trust. So often in government, I feel like they depend, like academia does, on the peer review model, if we're lucky. <laughs> if we're lucky, they depend on it. Um, and that doesn't scale or work process-wise for us. 
And so we have to figure out a little bit more in regards to how do we create this trust. And I'm sure all of y'all have been on talks here at this conference where we are talking about that trust aspect. You know, how do we get that for the safety and the security and things of that nature? I argue that the trust goes way past security. Security, yes, but to me that's a basic. You also have to figure out how are you going to be open and not subject to manipulations and do consensus and work with the communities and do all of those other different aspects. It's not just about code and it's not just about security patching. So one of the things that I think is extremely important in regards to all this is ethics. Um, not all standards bodies come from this point of view. We do, we've got this great 7000 series with the, which is ethics in action which comes from first doing that, it's one of the reasons the standards take longer. Um, when you're sitting there and you're addressing big topics like this, you have to bring in subject matter experts from a whole different arena than maybe we're always not used to working with. We bring in people from you know, UNESCO, the World Bank, all of those different things so that you can figure out what those global concerns are and those glo global perspectives. <clears throat> and then legal. And this is, I think, gonna be these two pieces I think are going to be some of the hardest for us in open source because not only do we have to deal with the legal of the United States, which a lot of us are in, but you have to do it globally. You know, one of the things, you know, when I worked at PayPal is, oh, right, so by um, doing money exchange in 220 different countries, what does that rule set look like? It's brutal. And we're going to have to figure that out together so that we can make sure that we do all of those different things. I don't know, are any of y'all working on open source that has been affected by GDPR? Yeah. So, you know, and then also in America we have disabilities and we have, the, we have young people and we have all of those different ones. Which kind of leads into the other one. Um, sometimes people conflate the two, they're, not, they're different. <laughs> Law, legal and policies are very different, um, especially since policies often focus on national interests. And sometimes you will have those competing national interests to deal with and concern yourself with. So be aware of what's happening on that. And that's why I said earlier, look to those studies in regards to the policies that are coming out um, for that. And also this is where, you know, there's a lot of dragons. Um, is once you start getting into the legal and the policy portions for something that you do want to have global acceptance of. And you want to go through the government approvals for. Um, ex and then of course export control. Let's go make it even more complicated and you know go across countries. Um, and again, I just want to stress the whole consensus building aspects of that. Because once you start doing that, you really are going to have to get country to country to work together. And to do that, you're going to probably need an outside party. Um, I don't think it's going to work very well trying to be insular in regards to it. Um, so how can we help each other on this? Well, change management, change management I think, is a huge one. Um, now Denise makes me want to go and rework the inner source change agent presentation um, <laughs> in regards to that because I feel like... We have no I, I know, I know. Well, I feel like we have to do the one that's like you know, the 2000 series at this point because it's just going to be so much more to consider and to know for when you're doing change agency in this realm. Um, so I wanted to list some players. I'm not going to go through all of this, but, you know, sitting there saying, okay, so for the 2010 report on policy in regards to open source, those are some of the countries that are listed. I went for the ones that y'all know, and then I went for a few that you're maybe like, what? The Saudi Arabian one is actually kind of awesome. <laughs> but as I was informed, they hired really good consultants. Um, China has them, Vietnam has them, Bolivia has them. You know, it's happening worldwide. I can't even imagine what this 2022 20, report's going to look like um, with all the craziness that's gonna ensue from open source policies there. And then there's a lot of the different standards bodies. Um, I kind of am a little biased. I put all the ones I'm talking to on the top and the ones I haven't been on the bottom. <laughs> but I'm sure y'all are already all familiar with um, the ones at the bottom anyhow. And then this is from the open source side. You know, who do we also have that, that's on our side, right? Um, and that's where I think it really comes in with, um, like in general, all the different open source 
foundations and groups that are around. And once again, you probably know all those players. But I really want you to take a good look at the country ones because those are starting to evolve and starting to come into play. And I can't stress the importance of them. And I'm going to embarrass Amanda, but the best I've seen by a long shot is Open UK. If you go in and check out all their work, right now for me, I point to them as best practices on all the work that they're doing, all the research they're doing, all of that. Awesome, thank you. Spectacular. So, <clears throat> and then the people that I kind of see in the middle. Um, things like OSI and um, Open Forum Europe and all of those different groups that are trying to be our referees and work with us on a lot of this type of work and going in between the two different ones. And then, of course, the foundations themselves. You know, those are the ones that I end up talking to the most because they want to fund. They don't know always how to. They're like, how do I know if an open source community is doing well? How do I know if it has diversity? How do I know if it's fitting all of these requirements? How, what are all of those things? You know, that's something that they're very seriously looking at right now. Um, so, and in fact, in fact, I think the Digital Public Good Alliance is trying to do this whole um, system for approval in regards to when you can become part of that. And I know that a bunch of those entities are looking to that as a validation mechanism for funding. So some of the trends that I see um, that's pushing a lot of this forward is, of course, global supply chain. You know, that's like an ongoing discussion over and over and over again. I may be a little biased. I used to be the VP of Hyperledger, <laughs> so I've got this blockchain thing going on. Um, but not evil blockchain, good blockchain. Um, and so I see a lot of that coming up, and that's what I end up talking to a lot of different groups about. I see a lot happening in regards to contact tracing. Again, I might be biased because I adore Denise. Um, and then I see a lot happening in, in regards to the Ukraine invasion. Again, I might be biased because I talk to Sarah all of the time and hear about all the OSINT stuff. But I, I see these as being some of the trends and major motivating factors for um, these things moving forward. So, talked about all the hard stuff. Let's talk about the good stuff. Benefits. So one, money, 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 money. Think about how much defense contractors get. Think about all of those other processes and once people figure out how to tap government money, how much they can make in regards to it. We can have some of that. You know, we can sit there and improve all of these different things without it having to go there. Why don't we figure out how to do that? And not only that, but then it won't be owned by some company. Instead, it will be actually owned by the government and the people and the people who work on it. I can't get over that enough as to how important I think that is. Um, you get to have global feedback and sometimes global visibility. How awesome is that? Sometimes it's hard to sit there and make sure that like, I know sometimes we work in our garage a bit in regards to when you're coding something and you don't think to get it on out there and you don't think to get all that sort of stuff going. But if you do, you can go worldwide. Um, you know, with Hyperledger, I was just amazed at the amount of adoption from the APAC community, even though we had nothing in their language, right? But as soon as we opened it up to translations and opened it up to co-working and opened it up to doing all those different things, boom, the floodgates opened. So I highly, you know, I think that's a huge bonus. Also global participation. So not just hearing back from them, but having them join in. When, you know, when we opened that up, the, it was kind of funny because it wasn't always visible to the rest of our community, but like the Chinese community on WeChat had like a hundred and something members and they went through and just translated everything and even created their own little leaderboard in WeChat where they're like, da 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 da, I just did this page, oh I'm doing these pages, oh I'm doing those pages. And they like just ripped right through it and did all of this documentation and all of this work um, just because of the fact that we made all of that more accessible to them and more usable for them. Um, and you know, this is, this is one that I'm a little controversial on, I know, but the maturity process, the maturity levels. Um, I love open source, but I see a lot of stuff. And I've been doing software development for a very long time. I don't want to date myself. Um, but 
one of the things that has always frustrated me going back and forth between corporate and open source is so many times there's no maturity processes. And that makes things dangerous and things of that nature. Um, government won't let us get away with that. Um, we will get it, we will get it out of them, and we'll get help from them in regards to it, just like they help the other contractors that they work with. They want to move people along in regards to that. And then also influencing and creating markets. You know, right now in open source, we're really focused on developer to developer. Let's branch out. Let's go and sit there and say, how do we, you know, make the world a better place? How do we do all these different things? Um, when we start doing all that, we can actually go and influence and create new markets and help with strategic initiatives um, and hopefully get to sustainability. Um, where am I at on time? Hmm? Okay. Okay, cool. So, and in regards to sustainability, um, once you do get integrated into that system, there's a reason those defense contractors never go out of business. Once we can get in and figure out a good operating cadence and do all of those different things, we become part of government infrastructure. Once we're part of government infrastructure, you know, for the good or the bad, things don't go away. Hopefully we can like make sure that we only do the good part. And one thing to remember on all this is that it is a long game. It is not short. Um, you know, as y'all, as I just said, I've been banging on the door since 2004. Um, I'm thrilled by what's happening now and very excited, but I do know the pace that government works at, and it's not our pace. It is not the open source pace at all. It's very different, and it requires a lot of patience and resilience, but I think we can get there. And one of the things I think that can happen with that is we can help fix democracy, because I feel democracy is very broken right now. I think we've all seen a lot of different stuff going on. And, um, and this can be a way to actually go in and help with that because we will be creating transparency. We, will, we can help with education. We can do all of those different pieces and deal with manipulation. Um, in regards to saving the world, again, you know, the UN created their SDGs, their strategic development goals, um, working with them on how do we do that with open source? How do we bring college students into it? How do we move forward in regards to that so that we bring in all these new young technologists who want to work in the open source way, right? And sit there and say, hey, here's some really cool nonprofits doing some cool stuff. How do we get you doing that too? You don't have to go work for the top five, right? You don't have to go work for that. You can actually go in here and do this. And by the way, serving the young people today, they've got some different value systems. And let me tell you, that's the direction they're going. You know, so working on things like climate change and helping with privacy and identity, ethical AI, once again, tooth the horn. Um, we have this great thing called Ethics in Action, and we did a playbook, and then we're also doing a certification program and doing things of that nature. And that seems to be the thing that gets government's attention most often because they see that as lacking in many other standards. Um, they really want to know what the ethics are going to be in regards to this because they do see the dangers. And then, of course, more things are getting open, right? Open hardware, which is one of the things that we're looking very strongly to and want to help support more and are supporting in our standards. So that's going to cause some big um, repercussions in regards to government. And, and of course, open data is already a concern because <laughs> AI stuff also kind of revol revolves around the data. <laughs> and then also all of the different research, you know, open science and things of that nature also revolve around the data and also doing it safely and securely and not violating people's privacy and doing all those types of things. So where to start? Um, one, education. And so once again, <laughs> please go read Open UK State of Open. I've read I don't know how many papers at this point, probably about 40. And it's by far my favorite. So if you have to read one, go read theirs. It's still going to be some homework. I'm not, I'm not, you know, Amanda, Amanda, they're not short, right? They're like. I'm sitting up in Mars. I'm like, no, read it. Read it in one sitting. I'm in the Exactly. You don't have to read it in one sitting. <laughs> With a cup of tea. With a cup of tea. Um, 
but I also want to stress that we need to go forward. We need to create more of these materials for talking with government officials. We need more training for them, for them to understand how to work well with us on this. They know how to work with standards. They know how to work with some of these other, they know how to work with the foundations. They know how to work with this. They don't understand how to work with open source. And so we have to help them in regards to that. Um, and so a lot of that includes things like best practices. Um, remember, consensus includes everyone. It's not just about corporate dominance. It's not just about a certain select community. It's not about things of that nature. You actually have to bring everyone into the picture. And so for those best practices, please remember the nonprofits, the governments, and the foundations. Um, because that's how you're going to really get it forward. Because the thing that we're going to have to address is the culture differences between the two of us. And then, of course, outreach. Um, non uh, governments turn to nonprofits um, because that's safer for them. They don't know to go talk to individual developers. They don't know to come and talk to any of those different things. No, you know, what did Biden do? Calls up the Linux Foundation, right? Because that's who he knows to go talk to. You know, what do they do in Europe? They call up some of their foundations that are nearby and say, what are we supposed to do here? So first, go find an existing group. If one doesn't exist, create it. You know, I put up several that each that several individual countries are now having their own. I think each country needs to have their own. Europe, each country is a definite microcosm that needs to have it. And so if there's not one existing, please go in and sit there and see about creating one or finding one or getting some people to. But we need to have more outreach and we need to have people who go to those government officials and talk with them. Um, I used to work for um, work. I didn't work. I volunteered for the ACLU. That's how I got into this whole open government thing, by the way, is I became a legislative liaison for the ACLU to talk to Republicans about technical issues. I went on nine out of 10. How did I do that? Well, first of all, I found that the majority of them simply weren't educated. The majority of the legislation was written by lobbyists and had implications that the representatives or the senators did not realize. As soon as I came in, presented my case, they let me rewrite those pieces of the legislation. One of them I had to attach a fiscal note to, which then killed it. But you know, other than that, that's, that was the majority of the work. And we need to do something like that here for us. We need to have a way to go in and keep an eye on those policy ones. Now the ACLU and EFF, they're fighting a very good game in regards to that, but they can't be alone. We need to have more of that, and we need to have people watching in those individual countries, too. Because I'm betting once that C C CSIS report comes out, we're going to see a lot of crazy stuff going down in those policy statements. I kid you not. I've looked at too much legislation to know that it's not going to be scary. And we're all going to have to chip in and figure out how to get that represented. So um, lessons learned from government. Um, there's a lot of different examples out there, and if you talk to some of those different groups, you can sit there and see those. Um, again, participation. Uh, we're actually doing a special issue on um, public, public affairs and open source in, um, the, for IEEE, for the um, Computer Society Org. So there's going to be an entire month dedicated to it. Um, the CFP closes December 1. Highly recommend putting something in there in regards to some of that, if there's, one, if there's any particular topics that you wanted to address or something along those lines. Um, Sarah and I are going to do one together on OSINT. Um, and then great groups to join. You know, I, when, so again, I'm going to like, come join our standard, talking about open source project governance. Please consider that. Um, there's also OSPO++, which focuses on open source program offices for governments, nonprofits, and academia which is a bit different than to do groups documentation, which is a little bit more corporate. And then you also have OSPO Alliance, which is doing the same thing. Um, in fact, they're working on something called the Good Governance Initiative um, that I'm participating on. And the first edition of it was focused on corporate, but now we're adding in the government and nonprofits as well. So um, we are broadening the scope of that documentation. And you know, like I said on this, you have to remain vigilant. You'll have to watch those different things. And you know the most important aspect, I think, of this is going to be patience and resilience. We're all going to have to take care of each other. We're all going to be tired. 
Um, we're all going to be frustrated. We're going to be confused. Um, I live in the United States. It's not good. Um, you know, one of the weird things that happened to me back in the day when I first started Citeability, which was talking about you know, having everything be citable and um, publicly distributable, um, especially anything that was paid for by government. I had an, I had an argument with Aaron Schwartz. I don't know if any of y'all know him or not. Um, but he did a lot for wanting uh, a lot of the government data to also be open and public. Um, he went about it a different way than me. And I sat there and I said, you know, Aaron, you keep doing what you're doing. You're going to get arrested. And Aaron's like, well, you're ineffective. You know, and in two years' time, he had died after being harassed by the FBI. And I was burnt out. So unfortunately, we, we, were, we were both right. Um, to much tragedy. So we really do need to be there for each other because as we know, the polarization is getting worse. The propaganda is getting worse. We're watching all these manipulations happen. We have to be there for each other. And we're going to have to like go through this because I don't think open source understands what's coming in regards to that. And we really do have to work through it. So thank you. Here's my contact information. Um, find me on Twitter, find me on LinkedIn. Um, there's the website for the, the, the work that I do. And uh, by the way, here's a bunch of da -da 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 references. So I'll be posting the slides on Twitter after this, and then you can go grab the slides to go get the links that you want. Questions? Yes. OK, so I actually didn't have a question. I had a comment, if that's OK. Sure, comments are good. So when you were talking about with governments you know, advantage the open source communities, of course the open source community can get more funding. But one of the other things that I would like to point out with open source versus closed source is, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a government official, uh, but I have most certainly been a national defense contractor uh, for many years, um, is that if you have a greater role participation of open source, even if it's in um, defense contracts, no matter which country it is, you know, whether it's the UK or India or the United States, you then have greater accountability and security on a national and global level, because nothing like solar winds mm -hmm. would have happened. You know, because you would have a scrutiny to make sure that the system, the code is set up properly and that everything is uh, up to date and that it's working as it should. Right, right. So you're talking about making, you know, the more that we embed ourselves into those systems, the more secure things will be. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. And you had a question? Yes. Call that out specifically. Um, check if someone is already doing work around the areas you're looking at. If there isn't one, you can start your own org, but it doesn't always mean there has to be a constant growth of new initiatives. Um, and to leverage other people's resources, you mentioned some really great ones here that I'm looking forward to taking a look at myself. Um, and you don't have to do all the work on your own. Right. Totally, totally. And, and just, he was reiterating this point. First, go find the other, the groups that already exist. Don't undercut them. Don't split the message. You know, don't, don't do any of that. Find them first, and then, but then if they don't exist, create your own. And like Amanda so generously offered in regards to the Open UK, they have a lot of templates ready to go. So if you wanted to go in and start surveying and doing other countries and figuring this type of information out, for another country, you can go in and do so. And so that kind of collaboration is like, it's, it's what's going to accelerate us and you know, really get us through that process. So thank you. Yes, definitely. Yes? Hi. First, thank you very much. Um, I think the Open Government Partnership by the OECD, it used to have some parts regarding open source and trying to collaborate between uh, IT of different companies, of uh, different governments. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, it's interesting to see if we can bring it back to a certain level, because government sharing the same systems, then the same data, uh, is quite important. I saw that, uh, I, try, I helped the Israeli Ministry of Health when COVID started to, to do contact tracing of an Israeli app, and then they figure out they need to do it in collaboration with at least Europe mm -hmm. uh, for close contacting uh, tracing, and I think 
other things we should try to, to rekindle. Uh, otherwise, we're doomed to do the same idea all over the government. So getting that into government is the one of the ways to bring them into open source. Mm -hmm. their, own, their own IT and start to consume uh, and create open source in different ways. But we need to work hard to make them sure they will let down some of their professional ego into taking something from another country. Yeah, yeah, it's been a very mixed bag for me dealing with internal IT. Um, sometimes it's been amazing, and sometimes it's been, you know, sometimes they're hungry for it, and you can find a, a champion in there. And then other times you will, it, it's 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 the opposite, and so that it's really difficult. When I post this, could you post a link to the group that you were just talking about? Yes, sure. Awesome, thank you. And then, so it says stop. Can I take the two more questions, or, okay, Amanda. Can, can I do this, by the way? Would yeah. this work for them? Sorry, I'm just at the end of the week. I don't even know how to like turn it on now. So is that... Does that work? There you go. So I was just picking up on a few really things that different people have said about interaction with governments. We, um, we specifically designed State of Open, so it's always really rewarding when you wax lyrical about how good it is. But we specifically designed it to try and get interaction with government. And w we followed a process in the year one with the three phases that we did to try and tell a story that government we knew would react to and looked at the economic values. And we have a survey that works with that as well that we've updated this year. And the engagement that we got back from the UK government, and I quote, uh, despite the UK having been, the, I think, the first country in the world to have an open first policy 10 years ago, you have highlighted an area that we would otherwise have overlooked. And awesome. I, I talk to them now and I describe it as the pizza base and all the toppings are all the exciting things that everybody gets, you know, everybody wants. And it's the blockchain and the cloud and the AI and the ML, but they forget about the base because it's boring and that's the open source. And that's the infrastructure we're talking to them about now. So I don't want to hog too much time, but we're doing an Anglo-American focused event on the 17th of October. And then we'll have an international event next spring trying to bring governments and public sector people together to talk about how this all works. So if anybody's interested, feel free to, to contact us. Yeah, and can you pass it back to Denise? Um, I wanted to say that we're, a lot of us are going to Brno in a minute here because um, Europe has kind of decided that Brno is the, the best example of a fully featured municipal open source implementation, which I'm kind of interested to go see. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in it. But um, you said when you were on the slide before that, um, not that one, the other one, <laughs> that uh, really Europe should have its own you know, its own community practice basically is what, what you were talking about. Um, but what you said was um, that they should have their own because they're a significant microcosm. In fact, Europe is bigger than the US. No, 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 no. I wasn't <laughs> talking about Europe. I said each country. Each country should have one. Each country should have one. Mm. That's why I said is each country around the world should have one because each country is its own microcosm. Yeah, that's and true. Has its own le it, it has a lot, a lot to do with legal and policy is why I say that. The European Commission ha or European Union has offered to fund 20 member state, um, oh, I suppose, 10 in academia and 10 in, in uh, municipal government. But nobody's holding them to find out how you do that. Like, how do you apply? Right, so I think pressure when, uh, there, it's almost like the old days when companies would issue something saying they were gonna do open source and then it, nothing would happen. <laughs> so um, I feel like those of us that live in Europe really need to keep the pressure on to make them actually do what they said they were gonna do. And they're all kind of pointing at Brno going, see? And we're like, mm, yes, <laughs> and? <laughs> so, thank you. No, thank you, yeah, no, no, I didn't mean Europe as a microcosm, I meant each and every country because of dealing with watching and uh, I guess advocating in regards to legal and policy um, because that does seem to be one. It, Europe is unusual in regards to the fact that you do have all of those different countries together and they do form consensus models for some of that too without the countries always having to have each of their individual ones. But like watching France sit there and go, no, <laughs> has been fun. <laughs>
um, I have to admit, and I'm excited to be going to the thing in Paris and talking about some of that um, in November. So, yeah, totally, totally. Thank you, Denise. A anything else? All right, well, thanks, everyone. Appreciate coming, and find me on the...